The first one is called the sum rule. And it's something that you have certainly seen before. And what that means is if you have the limit as x approaches a of two functions, one of them is called f of x, and the other one is g of x, and they're added together. So you're taking the limit of the sum of two functions. That's the same thing as the limit as x approaches a of f of x plus the limit as x approaches a of g of x. Now make sure you understand that. What basically I'm saying is if I give you two functions that are added together and ask you to find the limit, then all you really have to do is find the limit as x approaches the same number a of the first function, and then also separately the limit of the second function going to the same point, and then I can add the results. So it's kind of like if I have a big function that's just a bunch of things added together, I can take the limit of each individual part. And believe it or not, you've already really been doing that, right? Think about a polynomial. Think about x squared plus 2x plus 5. Well, the x squared can be thought of as a function. The 2x can be thought of as another function. And if you have plus 5 or plus 10 or minus 5, that constant thing is another function. It's just constant. And when we were doing limits before, I told you, hey, the first thing, you can make a table or you can just try to plug it in. When you plug in the value into each one of these things, what you're doing is you're finding the limit of each individual function, and then you're adding them all together. So you've actually used the sum rule all, basically all the time uh, without realizing it. But it's a formal uh, limit law, so we're going to write it down. You know, you never know. You may be asked to list these things on a test or something. All right, so we have another one called uh, multiple. If I have the limit as x approaches a of some number, c is a number, times f of x, okay? So this could be 5 times a function or negative 3 times a function. c is just a constant. That's why we call it c. Then basically you can take the constant out and multiply it times the limit as x goes to a of f of x. Okay, so what it's basically saying is if I'm taking the limit of a number multiplied by a function, then I can just take that number totally away, take the limit of the function, get the limit, and then go back and multiply. I can basically remove the constant uh, from the outside, deal with it later, and then multiply them at the end. Believe it or not, you've actually done this before too. What if you were doing the limit of, let's say the function is 5x. 5 is a number times x. That's a function, right? How did I tell you to do that? I said, well, go ahead and try to plug it in first. If you get a weird answer, then you have to do something different. Otherwise, that's your limit. Well, when you take and you plug in the value into the function, if it's 5 times x, plugging this in is finding the limit of, in that case, x, as x, as, uh, x approaches whatever number you're trying to approach. You plug it into the value of x, you get the limit, and then you multiply by 5. So when you find the limit by substitution of simple things like 5, 5x five squared, 5 times the sine of x or whatever, you're just plugging in the value into the function and you're multiplying later. You're basically doing exactly what you say you're doing over here. All right. The next one's called the difference. So if you have a sum rule, what do you think is going to happen if I have the limit as x goes to a of the difference of two functions, f of x minus g of x. Just use your intuition. What do you think is going to happen? Well, if this one works like this, this one is going to work like this. The limit of x approaching a of f of x minus the limit as x approaches a of g of x. So basically, if something is added or subtracting, if you have two functions either added or subtracted, basically you take the limits of the individual functions and you continue to keep the sign that was linking them in, in the beginning. And you've actually already used this. What if I give you a polynomial that's like 3x squared minus 4x? There's a minus in there. And I told you, hey, try to plug it in. And you plug it in. Well, what you're doing is you're finding the limit of the first function and the limit of the second function, and you're still subtracting. Okay, so you're basically honoring the, 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 the subtraction that was going on to begin with. Okay. Um, then we have one called product rule. I bet you you can probably... Um, you can probably guess what's going to happen here. If we have the limit as x approaches a of f of x times g of x, these are multiplied together, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to be the limit as x approaches a of f of x, okay? 
and I'll just kind of put this here, multiplied by the limit x approaches a of g of x. So it's the same story, different verse. If you have two functions multiplied together and you're taking the limit, then I can break the functions apart, okay? And then I can multiply the limits of the individual, or I could find the limits of each individual function, and then I can multiply together. And that kind of follows from what we have done before. And then the last one is called the quotient rule. And it's basically exactly what you would guess. If you have the limit, x approaches a of f of x divided by g of x, and you're taking the limit of this kind of this whole division of two functions, a function on top and a function on the bottom, then what you basically do is you say the limit of x approaches a of f of x divided by the limit as x approaches a of g of x. And believe it or not, you've used that before too because we've done lots and lots of problems where you have something on top and something on bottom of a fraction. And I told you, I said, hey, go ahead and plug it in. So you plug it into the top, you plug it into the bottom, and you see what you get. Plugging it into the top, plugging it into the bottom is finding the limit of the top and finding the limit of the bottom. Now these are what we call the core, uh, or what I call the core um, limit laws. Basically, these are the ones, these are the granddaddies. If you add or subtract functions, you just honor the addition and subtraction and you take the limits of the individual things. If you're multiplying by a constant number, you just save the number for the end, find the limit, and then multiply it at the end. And if you have a product or a quotient, which is division, then you just deal with them individually and everything is the same. Now, adding and subtracting and multiplying and dividing behave this way because doing the limit is what we call a linear operation. Linear operations you're gonna learn about all through calculus. So this whole idea of the way it behaves so nicely like this, you don't have to remember anything crazy. All you have to do is think, well, it does what it really should do. And I guess I'm trying to foreshadow for you when we get on a little bit later into calculus in your sequence, you'll learn about the derivative. You'll also find that the derivative is linear and the derivative behaves in a similar way. In other words, we'll get to much later, you have the derivative of the sum of two functions and what it'll be is the derivative of this function plus the derivative of the other function. If you have the quotient of two functions, it'll, it'll behave in, in similar ways and you can go, go and look through those when we get there. Um, when you do integration, which is a, another topic we'll learn way in calculus, you'll learn that there's similar similarities to what we're learning here as well. But for now, these are the core limit laws. Now there's some other laws, some other limit laws that are important. Um, and I want to point those out to you uh, because there's things that you'll probably use quite a bit. So um, the first one, these are kind of the granddaddies. These other ones are important, but I wouldn't call them granddaddies. You don't run into them probably quite as much. So I'll just list them. Um, if you have the limit as x approaches a of x raised to the power of n, okay, what's the limit going to equal? It's going to be a to the power of n. n can be a number, like it could be, this could be x squared or x to the third or x to the fourth power or whatever. What it's saying is you just take the value of a that you're approaching and you can plug it in there and you get a to the nth power. This is kind of something I've already told you a long time ago. I said, hey, if you have polynomial, those are always smooth and continuous. So you just try to plug the thing in and it's basically going to be the limit. And this is what it's basically telling you. You take the value here and you stick it in there. So if it's x squared, you put the value in here and square it, and that's going to be your, your uh, limit. Okay. Um, I have another guy here. What if you have the limit as x approaches a of f of x, any arbitrary function raised to the power, raised to some power, then this is going to look very familiar. The limit of x approaches a of f of x you take the limit first and you raise it to the power. So this is kind of an extension of this. Here is just a simple uh, part of a polynomial, just, a, just an exponent, right? This is a lot more general. This is saying I can have any function in here. f of x could be a giant polynomial. f of x could be sine of x. f of x could be tangent of x. If I have any function here raised to a power, like let's say I had sine of x squared and I wanted to take the limit here. What it's basically telling you is serve the limit on the inside of here and then when you're done, you can square the answer. There, okay? And it's basically the same thing as what I've always told you, go ahead and try to plug it in. Because if you had sine squared of x, 
then what would you do? You would just try to plug it in, right? And then you would square it at the end. So that's doing this exact same thing as you would do if you were just gonna plug the thing in. Okay, so those are important. And they look similarly related. In fact, this is just a generalization of this guy because x is just a function in here. All it's basically saying is find the limit and then raise the power at the end, okay? Now here's a very simple one. I'm gonna write it down only because you see it in your book and I'm just trying to write down things that you'll see in your book. If you have the limit as x approaches a of some constant, c is not a variable, it's actually just a constant. So if you have the limit as x approaches a number of the number four, what do you think the limit's gonna equal? It's just gonna be the same number, c. Because basically what's happening is, here is you, you attempt to plug it in, but there's nowhere to put it, so you can't really plug it in, so it, the limit is just itself. And this is the same thing as thinking about if, the, if f of x is just a constant, then it's just a horizontal line, right? It's a horizontal line. Any value of x you approach, you're gonna reach the same value because this is a horizontal line in this case. And this dovetails with the limit as x approaches a of just a simple, uh, a simple function x. What do you do? You plug it in, you stick it in there, and that's gonna be equal to a. These are things that you know um, because I've always been kind of teaching you this, but these are formally written down under limit laws in your calculus book, and so I wanna make sure that we at least write them down and discuss them so you don't think that, hey, what are these laws? You know, he never told me about these laws. I'm just trying to tell you these are the same things we've been doing a lot. Here's another one. If you have the limit as x approaches a of one over x to the nth power, what do you think you're gonna do here? If I said, hey, give it a shot, you would say, well, I'll try to plug it in into the place where x is. So this is one over a to the nth power, okay? And here you have to put the caveat that a is not equal to zero because if a is zero, then the whole thing goes to infinity. But everywhere else, as long as you're not approaching zero, you would be, it would behave just like this. And basically it's just plugging in a value. What if you had the limit as x approaches a of the nth root of x? Remember, you have an nth root. This could be a square root. This could be a cubed root. This could be a fourth root, whatever. Okay, well, you just plug it in. Basically, it's gonna be the nth root. You stick it into the value here, the nth root of a, just like that. Okay, and I have one more, and then we'll be done with limit laws in this section. And the last one is if you have the limit of x approaches a of the nth root of some function, f of x, what do you think you're gonna do? Well, what you can do is you can move that limit on the inside. So it's basically gonna be the nth root of the limit as x approaches a of f of x. Okay? So that's the last limit law. These are designed to give you kind of a jump start. And when you, uh, a jump start on how to tackle limits. And, you know, I could have presented these a lot earlier. I mean, I honestly, I could have started the entire course with these limit laws. But if I wrote all of this stuff down, look at how messy it looks. I mean, it should be easy for you to understand because it's intuitive now. But really, it looks very, very, very messy when you just kind of stare at it for the first time. If I would have written this down in lesson one and told you, hey guys, here's this thing called limits and here's some limit laws and we're gonna solve some problems. I mean, I think a lot of people would be very intimidated. But now that we've done a lot of problems and you understand what limits really are and we've done the definition and you kind of have some practice, these limit laws shouldn't be very intimidating because they're just formalizing. Somebody has proved that these are always true for limits for all cases, basically. And now you're allowed to use them in any problems you have. So for instance, the famous one I give is a polynomial. If I tell you, take the limit as x approaches a of x squared plus 2x plus 4. And I've told you many times, hey, I can plug it in. Right? But now you know why you can plug it in. Because the sum rule says, I can, if any two functions are added together, I take the limits of the individual function. So if it's x squared plus 2x, how do I take the limit of that x squared? Well, then you come down here and you say, hey, if it's x squared, all I do is I plug it in. This will be, you know, 2 squared if I'm approaching x is equal to 2 or something like that. Okay? Um, and if it's x squared plus 2x, how do I take the limit over here of the limit of 2x? Well, you come down here and you say, well, the limit as of, of x approaches a of x, you just plug the value in, and we know from the multiple thing that if it's two times a function or a number times a function, you just take the limit here, in this case it would be the limit of x, and then you multiply by two at the end. So I'm not gonna do a lot of problems here because I, I, it's just a waste of your time. I really, I wanna spend time giving you practice, and actually I've given you a lot of practice already. 
So from the top, basically if you add two functions together, you take the limits individually and add them together. If you're having a function multiplied by a number, you take the limit first and then you can multiply at the end. If you have the difference of two functions, you just take the difference of their limits. And if you have the product of, or the quotient of two functions, you can do the product of their limits or the quotient of their, of their limits. This is useful for polynomials because it's basically x raised to the power of anything. Basically it's saying just plug it in. If you have something more general like any function, x squared plus 3x and you raise the whole thing, or if you have tangent and raise the whole thing to a power, then you can take the limit of the inside and do the power at the end. Limit of a constant is just the constant itself. Limit of x, you just plug it in, you get the value there. Limit of 1 over x to the end, you just plug it in, get the value there. Limit of the nth root of x, you just plug it in, get the value there. And then the limit of the nth root of any function at all, just take the limit and then do the nth root at the end. So you see the common thread here is that almost all the time you can just plug the value in and get the value of your limit. And we've learned about cases when you can't really rely on that totally. If you get weird answers like 0 over 0, you have to do some simplification first. But still, when you get to the end game, you can still plug it in to find the value of the limit after you have done that simplification. So these limit laws, keep them in the back of your mind. We're going to do some practice problems in the next section just to give you a little more practice with it. But really, you already have a lot of practice with it. You already have some experience with it. So follow me on to the next section. We're going to gain more experience using these limit laws and kind of showing you where everything comes from and tying it all together in calculus. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.